in an hour on BBC Two, and in place of our scheduled programme, we've comedy with The Likely Lads, followed at 9.30 by a rummage through the BBC Post Bag of 1962 with Robert Robinson and Points of View. TV 50, a celebration of 50 years of television. Now we have the first in a new series of wildlife programmes. Tonight, uh, we've got rather a different programme for you. Hello, good evening. For the first time, Congo is going to meet another little chimp. And, yes, you are. Fifty years of natural history on television, this Sunday at 8 o'clock on BBC Two. And now we focus on the life and famous meeting in Africa of Dr Livingstone, with an episode from the award-winning drama series narrated by James Mason, The Search for the Nile. In the late summer of 1864, John Hanning Speak spent the last afternoon of his life shooting rabbits. With one shot, he created a mystery about his death which was never George. to be solved and brought to a tragic climax his long and bitter feud with Richard Burton about the sources of the Nile. Get back and get some help. Oh, oh don't move me. Oh. managed to disprove Speak's theory that the Ripon Falls, where the Nile floods out of Lake Victoria on its journey to the north, was the true and only source of the river. The argument that had obsessed Victorian England for so long seemed to be over. But it was not. There were many distinguished geographers who could not agree that the Nile was settled, as Speak had so brashly claimed all those years before. Most dogged and persevering of them all, David Livingstone had set out once more to find what he called the watersheds of Africa. Weak in health, he pushed his stubborn bones into the interior in one last effort to solve the mystery of the river. His only regular companions were Susie and Chuma, the two faithful servants whom he had rescued from slavery. Fetch my medicine box, please. Yes, what? Get one in my bed. 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 Get one in my bed
He says, medicine box, gone. Gone? He says his brother took it. He gone too. We find him and kill him. You will not, Susie, do you hear me? Let him go, he's not to blame. No medicine box. We all die. Perhaps too. But then we'll all die anyway when God's death comes to us. It's better than any killing we can achieve. Go and make a fire. We'll camp here for the night. For six years, the world was to hear nothing of the great explorer. Africa simply swallowed him up. No one knew whether he was alive or dead. In October 1869, a young man of 28 named Henry Morton Stanley arrived at a hotel in Paris. With no father that he ever saw and a neglectful mother, at 15, he had run away from the cruelties of a workhouse school in Wales and stowed away on a ship bound for New Orleans. Now, he was a tough American newspaper correspondent. He had been sent for by James Gordon Bennett, a rich young man whose father was the proprietor of the New York Herald. Yes? Who are you? My name is Stanley. Yes, of course. Come in, sit down, have some coffee. Thank you. And what do you think of Paris, Mr. Stanley? Have a care what you say. Every morning I find myself a little bit more in love with the place. Well, I arrived in a nice sleeper, so it seems a, a large town, not greatly to my liking. You are in a hurry, Mr. Stanley. It is to mine. But then I imagine our tastes and enjoyment would differ greatly. Work is my principal enjoyment. Yes, I can see that might be so. Well, now, work is what I have for you. And it will take you a long way from Paris. I've had an idea for the paper, Mr. Stanley, a great idea. Sir? Where do you think Dr. Livingston is at the moment? Livingston? Well, I, uh, I have no idea. Well, do you think he's alive? Well, he may be, he may not. Well, I think he is alive. And that he can be found. And you are going to find him. Well, you really think that Livingston can be found? In the whole of Africa? Yes, yes, go and find him, wherever he is. The old man may be in desperate need. And I want the world to know that the New York Herald cares about Livingston. Take enough supplies with you to help him, should he require it. Better yet, rescue him. Do what you think best, Mr. Stanley, but find Livingston. Sir, have you uh, considered the expense of this little journey? <laughs> you tell me what it'll cost. Well, Burton and Speak's expedition to Lake Tanganyika cost uh, about 3,000 pounds. It can't be done under 2,500. Well, I'll tell you what you do. Draw 1,000 pounds now, and when you've spent that, draw another 1,000. And when you've gone through that, draw another thousand. And when that's gone, draw another thousand. But find Livingston. I will attempt it, sir. I have a feeling that whoever finds Livingston may also find the Nile. Good day to you, Mr. Stanley. <laughs> Central Africa, at this time, was still a place of horror and atrocity. For the most part, the slave traders went about their business in the obscurity of the interior, but just occasionally, their activities were witnessed by someone who was prepared to tell the world.
I am heart sore and sick of human blood. It is not a slave trade. It is a murdering innocent people to subdue the survivors. It is indescribable. It is the burning bottomless pits. Tukumbe! I could pistol down every last one of your murderers, Tukumbe! The firing is almost finished. Kill me. Go on, kill me! Then all the world will hear of it! Like so many explorers before him, Henry Stanley decided to begin his African journey at Zanzibar. To avoid any controversy, he decided not to reveal that he was a newspaper correspondent, nor even the real purpose of his journey. To the British consul in Zanzibar, Dr. John Kirk, he appeared simply as a wealthy American with a desire to travel into the interior. Would it be a godsend had any of those gentlemen, Burton, Speak or Grant, give them some practical information in their books on how to ready an expedition for Central Africa? I was with Livingston, you know, on the Zambezi. If I can help in any way. Oh, is Livingston a personal friend of yours? I think he would say we were friends. You don't know. Friendship, as you might understand it, does not come easily to him. If he thought there was another white man in the vicinity, he would very quickly put a hundred miles of swamp between them. Well, it hardly sounds like the great Dr. Livingston. Mr. Stanley, if I may say so, you've rather a simple idea of great men. They can also sometimes be difficult men. For years, I've had the greatest respect for him, for his energy and force of mind. I still have. But he's also just about as ungrateful and slippery a mortal as ever I came into contact with. Well, I trust, sir, that Dr. Livingston is more loyal in his friendship than you appear to be. Mr. Stanley, may I inquire, where are you going? I'm going into Africa, Dr. Kirk. And now, if you'd be so kind as to assist me with supplies, baggage animals, copper wire and beads, and where the best porters would be hired, I'd be most grateful. <laughs> All good men, sir. Speak faithful. Put them in line, Bombay. Ah, see my men for one. Sound the advance. Tired. To go any bit to save it. Trend the tired. idea what difficulties and dangers might lie ahead, 
Stanley began to hack his way into Africa. His purpose? To find one man somewhere in that huge continent who might quite possibly no longer be alive. Once out of the jungle, his path lay due west along the old slave trail to Tabora, which Burton and Speke had traveled 14 years earlier. What is all this? Strike the camp. They refuse. There's fever in next village. They believe they all die. Now get back here, all of you, now. If there is fever, we have medicine. Nobody will die. Get back here now, or I will bring death on you myself. We're not going to Strike the camp, Bombay. Higher, Twanze Kazi. Hey, my little, Twanze Kazi. Higher, higher, Twanze, Twanze, Araka, 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 Araka. It was not long before the Africans had their own name for Henry Stanley. Bula Machari, the breaker of rocks. A new force had arrived in Africa. Travelling at twice the speed of Speak and Burton, Stanley reached the town of Tabora in three months. It was still the principal Arab staging post for slaves and ivory on their way down to the coast. <coughs> but the Arab grip on the caravan routes had been weakened by a chief named Mirambo, who had stirred the local tribes into rebellion and was even threatening Tabora itself. You are telling me that all the roads to Ujiji are blocked, but your Arab brothers no longer have the power to trade in these areas. Mirambo has already taken all the land of the Washensi, and in shortly it will flame to all tribe of Tanganyika if we do not descend on him and destroy him. And do you not think but it is you yourselves who have caused the tribes to revolt by your activities. These questions are too big for us, friend Stanley. We are very simple men. We do as our fathers have done. We follow the word of prophet. And does the prophet counsel you to trade in human souls? If you march with us, we can have peace. I can see in their eyes they are determined on war. 
If the way forward is truly blocked, I have no choice except to partake of their enthusiasm. So be it. In the spring of 1871, the Royal Geographical Society in London acquired a new president. Sir Roderick Murchison was dead, and his place was taken by Sir Henry Rawlinson, a distinguished soldier and archaeologist whose best days were already behind him. And gentlemen, uh, I don't think we can wait any longer. We ought to, I think, start our meeting. Your Grable. Colonel Grant, please sit here. Well, gentlemen. Ah, oh, Burton. Good of you to come. I was summoned, Sir Henry. A matter of vital importance to the society. I thought at least the earth was off its axis. I have received some disturbing news that could have a bearing on the fate and safety of Dr. Livingstone. The nation waits with bated breath. Gentlemen, some weeks ago I received a letter from Dr. John Kirk, Her Majesty's Consul in Zanzibar, informing me that a young American named Henry Stanley had set out into the interior of Africa with an exceedingly large caravan. Kirk thinks that he may be uh, after Livingston or he may be looking for the Nile. Today comes a further report that this young man, who seems to be a journalist, has got himself involved in large-scale hostilities between the Arabs and the Africans in the region of Tabora. Now, much as we may dislike reports of American interference in this region, our first concern must be for Dr. Livingstone. With his lifeline cut in Tabora, there must be grave doubts as to his safety. I say we should rescue the doctor. You mean a relief expedition with all the costs that, that would entail? I do, sir. Burton, have you any views? I have experience, Sir Henry, which might be more valuable. Just because there is another white man in this area tacking himself to a minor battle or two, it hardly means all Africa will turn on Livingston and devour him. Colonel Grant, you know the country. Well, on this particular point, and knowing the areas we both do, I'm inclined to agree with Burton. Hmm. May I add, gentlemen, that on your behalf, I inquired of Mr. Stanley's employers, the New York Herald, and I received this reply. Leave Stanley ill of fear in Tabora. <laughs> <laughs> However, I'm now informed that the message should read, Leave Stanley ill of fever. <laughs> in his haste to push on into the interior, Stanley made a serious mistake. The Arabs had proved fickle allies and had left him to face Mirambo on his own. He'd lost many men. And in return, he now risked being branded as a slaver by the African tribes that lay ahead of him. All right, Bobby, prepare them. Aye, Tayari. What is it? Stanley, Stanley and Fendi. This is your water, brothers. I have other matters to attend to. But I can assure you, by the ways and means that I have observed your men go into and come running out of battle, that it will take you some ten years to put down this renegade. I cannot wait that long. No, good now. To add to his predicament, the Arabs now presented him with a young slave boy as a farewell gift. If you will come with me, I will treat him as my child. All right, Maggie. Come on, yeah. See, Mama. Let his name henceforth be Kalulu, and let no man take it from him. I baptize thee, Kalulu, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Holy Ghost. Amen. I have taken a solemn oath never to give up the search until I find Livingston. Alive or his body. No living man or living man shall stop me. For something tells me. I don't know what it is. Something tells me that I shall find him. A week later, they saw a caravan approaching. Bombay, ask them where they are from. Yes, Ban. Sheikh, Rafiki, Abari. Mama. What are you doing? What are you doing? Karibuni. Ivi Karibuni. Karibuni. Ah. Buana? A white man. They've seen a white man. How is he dressed? Like the Buana. Young or old? Old, with white hair on his face. He's sick. Where are they from? From the lake. Ujiji. It's Livingston. It must be Livingston. On Friday, November the 3rd, 1871, 236 days after leaving the coast, Henry Stanley came down from the hills above the village of Ujiji on the shores of Lake Tanganyika. Livingston, I presume. Yes. I thank God, Doctor, that I have been permitted to see you. I feel thankful that I'm here to welcome you. Ah, oh, but So there you are. I need your advice. Look what it says here. What does it say there, Sir Henry? The Americans have come out into the open. The man Stanley is in Africa, and he's deliberately looking for Livingston. What do you propose to do about it? It's become a matter of national honor now. I'm in touch with Downing Street, 
We're going to send a relief expedition immediately to Zanzibar, then on into the heart of Africa to look for Livingstone. I had no idea he was lost. Well, now then, Sir Henry, let us see. Mr. Stanley is in front by some 6,000 miles or more. What do you suggest your expedition sets out on? A magic carpet? I have here, Burton, a letter from Florence Nightingale. What a great one you are for producing rabbits from your pocket. She writes, May God speed every effort to save one of the greatest men of our time. If it costs 10,000 pounds to send him a pair of boots, England ought to give it. But England produces her great men, then England leaves them to perish. Oh, what do you think of that? Great little woman. She's right about England and wrong about Africa. The expedition leaves within the month. So what little damn puppy will you be sending into Africa? Some milk-fed daddy's dog tail who can hardly navigate his way around the duck pond in St. James's Park. Those are barely the words of a loyal member of this society. Puff, puff, Sir Henry. Puffity puff. With the aid of the medical supplies that Stanley had brought with him, Livingston could start once more on his lifelong task of ministering to the sick. The relationship between the two men had quickly developed into a warm friendship. Indeed, for Stanley, it was something more. In his feelings for this old man, he began to sense within himself the love of a son for his father, the father that he had never known. A morning such as this must give you great satisfaction. Aye, it does give me satisfaction. But I fear I'm doing no good at all. Oh, but Doctor, you must be the only man within a, a thousand miles with any proper knowledge of medicine. That is precisely why I can do so little. Next month, I move on to another village, a different tribe. And these people here get no more treatment. It might be better if they'd had none in the first place. Oh, you bring them more the medicine, you bring them kindness and faith. When you have been in Africa for as long as I have, the effects are curious, Mr. Stanley. I shall not easily forget, after my Zambezi expedition, we boarded a steamer at the Mozambique coast. I had an African servant with me, a good, devoted boy, one of my Christian converts. But the sight of that great steamer was too much for him. He went quite mad, jumped overboard, and was drowned. In the name of God, what had I done for that man? We uproot these people, teach them our faith, cure our fevers. But I fear we hide from them our own doubts. I have always believed that faith can conquer doubt. Without my faith in God, I could not believe in myself. Then you're a lucky man, Mr. Stanley. Frequently, when I'm weak, God gives me the strength to go on. But he does not see fit to rid me of my doubts. That is my burden. That and Africa. I killed my wife, you know. I knew that she died with you in the South. There is more than one way to kill a person. You can withhold love. That is enough to kill a woman. She lacked the strength to go on, but I kept on going. Doctor, she contracted a fever. I feel that you have allowed this thing to prey on your mind when you have been alone. You are wrong imagine that you are guilty in any way. Not proven, as we say in Scotland, Mr. Stanley. Not proven. The release of his imprisoned emotions turned Livingston into a new man. The two became inseparable. 
Have you seen the northern head of the Tanganyika, Doctor? Ah, I did try the once, but like Burton and Speaker, I was driven back by fever. And the Vardira tribe are very dangerous in that area. So we still don't know whether the river flows in or out. You are interested in the Nile, Mr. Stanley. <laughs> the whole world is obsessed with that subject, sir. Aye, I fear poor Captain Speak gave his life for it. Doctor, I didn't come to Africa as an explorer. But I have a great deal of curiosity on the subject. And I should be honored, sir. With myself and all I have at your disposal. You would, Mr. Stanley. Well, if we could prove that this Lake Tanganyika drains north into Baker's Lake Albert and thence into the Nile. And your own Nualaba River? That, too, I believe to be another fountain of the Nile. It flows north. But first, let us settle this matter of the lakes. Tomorrow, we'll start to make preparations. Anything for the Nile, Mr. Stan. But I'll not be made black man's meat for the Congo. <laughs> Together, the two men set out in canoes for the northern end of the lake. There they were confronted by the perplexing truth. The small river, Rusisi, flowed south into Lake Tanganyika and not out of it. Wherever it had its outlet, this great lake could not possibly be a reservoir for the Nile. The theory of a great chain of lakes stretching north from this point, which Richard Burton and then Samuel Baker had clung to for so long, finally collapsed. It began to look as if Speak, and Speak alone, had solved the mystery of the Nile. For Livingston, who knew that his strength was beginning to desert him, it must have been a moment of bitter disappointment. A penny for your thoughts, though. They're not worth it, my young friend. And let me suggest that, if possible, I might wish to keep them. Tomorrow you will be alone. Aye. The house will look as if a death has taken place. You'd better stop until the rains have come and gone. I wish I could, my dear doctor. But every day I stop now that there's no necessity for me to stay keeps you from your work. You must not think of me. I'd be right to say what I, Doctor, on my return, that nothing will change your mind about remaining here until you have satisfied yourself about the sources of the Nile. And that no matter how I entreated you, you would not come back with me to Zanzibar. It's not just the Nile, Henry. My work lies all around me. These are my people. You must forgive me if I have not told you before. You have done what few men could do. Far better than some great travelers have known. And I'm very grateful. If I gave you this, and I have nothing else in the world to give, would you consider it as a memento of our leave taking? Tired. I'll take a rest. Tonight, all our dancing is for you. It'll be our little farewell to you.
Even if Stanley had been ready to stay for a few more weeks, his porters were not. To these men of Zanzibar, the interior of Africa was a dark and dangerous place. They were eager to be home. Henry, this is all I want you to take back for me. After you've gone, I'm away to the west again. How long will that journey take you? A year, a year and a half, perhaps more. God guide you safe home and bless you, my friend. May God bring you safe back to us all. My dear friend, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bombay, prepare them. Even had my soul been a brass and my heart spelled it, I would have recognized the spirit of goodness which manifests itself in him. He came with a true American characteristic of generosity. The tears start into my eyes when I think of all the kindness. Henry Stanley was the last white man ever to see Livingston alive. Halfway back to the coast, Stanley nearly lost the only physical proof he had of their meeting. While crossing a flooded river, the porter carrying the letters and papers that Livingston had given him stumbled and fell. Hassan! Drop that and I will kill you. Fifty-four days later, after the most rapid march in the history of African exploration, Stanley crossed the straits once more to the island of Zanzibar. But the man whom Dr. Kirk was about to welcome was no longer the brash young American traveler he had met the previous year. There was a new authority, a certain coldness. He had done the impossible. He had found Livingston, and the world was about to know of it. Mr. Stanley, we've heard the good news. May we offer all our congratulations on the success of your mission? I thank you. May I present Mr. William Henn to you? He's come out from London with a relief expedition. For what, may I ask? To rescue Dr. Livingston. Let me tell you, sir, in the doctor's own words, he does not want rescuing. If he did, he could have come under my protection. What he needs, Dr. Kirk, he stores, and he's been getting none. But that's preposterous. I've been sending regularly. He asked me to tell you that you seem to be under the impression that good reached Ujiji in about a month. The last box packed by you was two years on the way. This is impossible. 
Who's been giving him that impression? My relief expedition can carry up everything the doctor needs. He asked me to give you this letter. Get it? He asked you to put at my disposal 500 pounds. I, I promise to take care of his immediate needs. You seem very well acquainted with his mind, Mr. Stanley. He's never written in this tone before. Surely it's clear it should be the Royal Geographical Society that carries up his goods. I fear the task for which you were commissioned is already done, Mr. Hen. The doctor has placed his affairs in my hands, and I am more than capable of carrying them out. Then what am I to do? Go home, Mr. Hen. Go home. After a wildly enthusiastic welcome in Paris, Stanley arrived in England. There was no official welcome at the docks and none waiting for him in London. To the Royal Geographical Society, he was an embarrassment and in some quarters actually a figure of derision. Charge, Bennett, charge. On, Stanley, on. So came the last news from Livingston. <laughs> it says here he is a Welsh bastard and a deserter from the American army. Probably stole those papers of Livingston's from some native courier. Wallinson yeah. reckons the man's an imposter. All the same, these journalist fellows, if they can't find a story, they invent one. <laughs> that year, the British Association for the Advancement of Science had chosen the seaside resort of Brighton for their annual conference. It was about to provide the setting for another dramatic climax in the checkered story of the Nile. Eight years before, at Bath, it had been Burton and Speke who were at the centre of the drama. Now it was the turn of Henry Stanley. With some reluctance, the Society invited him to attend one of their official dinners. Believe me, gentlemen, I have no wish whatever to belittle the achievements of the great Dr. Livingston. No one in our time, except perhaps for my late friend and colleague, Captain John Speak, has done more to enlarge our understanding of Africa. But as one who has dragged his weary feet through those dark regions, I feel entitled to say to you here tonight that I find it an extravagant idea that the source of the Nile may one day be discovered as far south as the Tanganyika. Yes, agreed. Agreed, absolutely. Or may I add that some link may be discovered between the Nile and this mysterious river which the good doctor calls the Lualaba. <laughs> Gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you, Colonel Grant. We're all most grateful to you, I'm sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now, <clears throat> may we call upon our adventurous American associate <laughs> to stand forth <laughs> and give us some account of his colorful exploits <laughs> in Central Africa. Uh -huh. Mr. Henry Stan. Uh -huh. <clears throat> <clears throat> Colonel Grant says that he believes Livingston has made a mistake about the Lualaba. He calls it an extravagant idea. Well, I would like to know how a geographer resident in England can possibly say the Lualaba does not exist, that there is no such river, when Dr. Livingston has seen it, has touched its shores. Well, whose word do we have for that? Do you have my word, sir? Dr. Stanley, I presume. <laughs> Let me tell you, sir, I resent all manner of impertinence and brutal horse laps at the mention of Dr. Livingston's name or of his sufferings. Sir, all we are asking for are facts, not colorful chit-chat. We're all scientists here and geologists. Yes, not readers of the New York Herald. Oh. <laughs> I begin to see you are not, sir. Better get on with that one. I begin to see you are not, sir. I believe you to be representative of Doubting Thomas, of the unbelieving unbelievers who refuse to accept the truth which I bring back with me. Oh, you oh. ridiculous Welsh bastard. Oh. Oh. Gentlemen, gentlemen. 
very to our guests to hear him out. Yes, we'd like to hear him out. All we ask, Mr. Stanley, is that you, in a reasoned and factual tone of voice, <laughs> speak to us as professional men about your journeys. <laughs> speak my mind. Mm. But I find myself surrounded by men who have no intention of believing. No, sir, I will not, sir. But I tell you this. I scored aside the cheap attacks and innuendos that I hear tonight. <laughs> I disregard them. Because in my own mind, I know that I'm surrounded by nothing other than armchair geographers waking up from their afternoon naps. Oh, Dear God, have I lost the elastic hope of my youth, the belief, the toil, and devotion to duty? would bring recognition at the hands of my fellow creatures, more happily born, more honored by circumstances than I. I can think of nothing but Livingston, out there alone in the African wilderness. And I begin to understand why he has chosen to lay his bones so far from home. He is my true father, one way or another. I shall finish his work. Come in. Mr. Stanley, I know you will have no great wish to see me, but I'm here officially. What is it now? Am I to be deported? Well, let me assure you, sir, I have no intention of staying here one more day. Mr. Stanley, I have come on behalf of the society to offer you a formal apology. You have not been treated as we would wish. I have been treated by your members, sir, as this so fit. If you will allow me to finish, sir. It is proposed that you should be offered our highest award, the Patron's Gold Medal. I hope we all hope that you will consider it some slight recompense for, for what has happened. You honor me, sir. I, I'm not a man for speeches. There's a, a, another matter, Mr. Stanley. This, this snuff box, I'm commanded by the Queen to present it to you. And if you are agreeable, you and I are to travel overnight tomorrow for an audience of Her Majesty at Balmoral. I see you have a, a cap like Livingston's. Yes, he gave it to me. It was his last gift. Stanley, I didn't understand. None of us. We didn't understand. For more than a year after Stanley had left him at Ujiji, David Livingston, always accompanied by his faithful servants, Susie and Chuma, had moved from village to village, growing steadily weaker. On the 29th day of April, 1873, unable to walk and suffering from long periods of incoherence, they brought him to a village on the southern shores of Lake Banguelo. 
First, Susie and Chuma dried the body of the dead missionary in the sun. Next, they cut out the heart and prepared a hole for it beneath the large Sunabari tree. Then began one of the most extraordinary acts of devotion in the story of African exploration. Susie and Chuma marched for eight months, for 1,500 miles, until they delivered the body of David Livingstone to the British consul at the coast. Susie and Chuma did this. And it cannot be said that it was entirely out of their own devotion to their dead master that they did it. They knew, too, that he was a much-loved man in his own land. They asked for nothing in return. But above all else, they had laid Livingston's heart beneath the soil of Africa, where the heart bled beneath the Sunabari tree, in that dark earth, there also bled the whole mind and will of this man. On BBC One now, there's the nine o'clock news, followed by the final instalment of the detective drama, Call Me Mister. Here on BBC Two now, I hand you over to our InVision announcer for this evening, Meryl O'Keefe. You know, there was a lot announcers were forgiven for, especially if the happenings were funny. You know, making verbal clangers, looking at the wrong camera, giving the wrong time, you know, the sort of thing. But one was seldom forgiven by viewers for having to announce that a promised programme was going to be replaced. So I'm sorry to say that we are not able to transmit, not only, but also plan for nine o'clock this evening. <laughs>